please stand as we sing the hymn. seats for the prayer. Let us pray. Oh dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the cross of Christ Jesus. We do believe that his holiness Burn against the things of this world. But grace you, Father God. His soul on sacrifice made all things possible because he conquered the cross and delivered us from it. And Father God, we do believe that his holiness, his holiness shine upon us and lead us towards you. Grace you, Father God, this morning we just thank you for the precious blood and the love of the almighty bleeding cross that keep us together as one family. Father God, we do believe there are many friends and family that are unable to come this morning. But Father, wherever they are, may that almighty bleeding cross of Christ Jesus flow upon them. Guiding them and leading them towards you because you are the center of their life. 
And Father, we pray this morning with one accord as your son, your servant, come to share your word. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That your word from this heart, your word from this mouth, the word that you have placed in his heart to speak to your people this morning. May it flow upon friends and family this morning, wherever they are, Father. We just thank you. And Father God, we just want to thank you. We do believe this morning that all things is possible with you. And Father, we pray for friends and family in hospital, unable to be in your house to praise you, to thank you. But we do believe in the name of Jesus that you are with them. Father, we just thank you because you have taken your daughter, Zenny. But Lord, we lift our heart with the family here. We lift them to you. We pray that your peace will flow upon them, guiding them and leading them. Father God, you are the center of this church. We lift this church to you. We just pray for every friends and family that come, that will come, Father. We lift them to you this morning. You are our hope. You are the one that continues to guard and sustain and provide for us, leading us each day. But Father God, more over this morning, we pray for this virus. We pray, Father God, that you would take it away. We pray for Spain. We pray for nurses and doctors, Father God. Friends and family that continue to walk towards this goal. We pray for your blessing, your protection upon them. And we just lift this service to you this morning. Take control, Father God. As we sing songs of praise to you, may your grace continue to guide and lead us. Take over your service this morning. Guide and lead your people. Bless them. Father God, we just ask all of these things in the name of Christ Jesus. We pray this morning. Amen. Scripture reading for today is Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. In our Bibles, it's page 976. And it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, and the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of humankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with, with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast." For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word of the Lord. Amen. Please, may we stand and may we worship the Lord in singing.
If you would pray with me, please. Father, we come before you today wanting to submit our hearts and our lives to your word. <clears throat> Praying that, Father, you would uh, bring us to the intersection again today where your word comes together with your spirit. Father, we just pray that as we look at the scripture today, that, Lord, you would open our eyes, that you would reveal, that you would show us things that either we've never known or things that we have long forgotten. And so, Lord, this is your time. We just pray that you would work in us as you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, as we start today, I want to I show you a, a picture. I don't know how well you can see that. That is from yesterday, and we just want to give thanks to God for social ministry team, for the donations. Um, as you can read there, 30 IBC families received food baskets during the weekend's food distribution. Thank you all who continue to donate and serve to make this possible. And so we just want to th thank God for that. Uh, just that God would continue to provide, that God would continue to open doors. Uh, let me tell you about a few other things, uh, additional ways that you and I can make that happen. Uh, one is, and you, most of you received the email, we have an email address called jobs at ibcmadrid.com. Let me ask you um, if you would be willing to give a little more time and a little more effort. All I mean by this is, is, is this. If something comes across your computer from your work that is talking about there's a job available, if you could send it to jobs at ibcmadrid.com. If you're walking into a store and you see a little sign that says they're hiring, take a picture, send it to jobs at ibcmadrid.com. Um, this is not a time for church members and church people to be living as individuals. Uh, let's bear each other's burdens. Let's do everything we can. We have people in our church who need jobs, all different levels of qualifications. And so nothing's too low, nothing's too high. I'm just saying as a group, if we network together, there are things that God can do through us that wouldn't be done if we work alone. So if, you, if I could just ask you, uh, just, let's just be on alert, pay more attention. If we see jobs available, let's get it to the social ministry team at that email address. And then they send it out to everybody in our church on that list. And then from there on, they see if that job is supposed to be for them. That's one thing. The other thing is starting next Sunday, it's only going to last about eight days, we are going to be receiving winter clothing like we've done in the past. And so as most of us can tell, the weather's, it's still a little confusing, but it, it's, it's trying to get cooler. And we just want to be able to uh, meet the needs of the people in our church who uh, don't have the coat or don't have the sweater or don't have the scarf. And so if you have things that are in good condition that you want to bring them by the church, if you would like to um, uh, buy something, like that, that's up to you. But once again, as a church, we're trying to get, come together and meet the needs of those in the church who have needs as the winter approaches. And so it starts next Sunday and it goes till the next Sunday. We're going to be receiving winter clothing for eight, eight days. I know that's complicated in the midst of restrictions and things because some of you listening can't even come into the city right now. Don't really know what that's going to be a week from now. Uh, but just, just know that these are things that we're trying to bring ab about just to meet the needs of the people in the church. What's going to happen is from the 25th to the 1st, we receive. From the 5th, 1st to the 8th, we give out. And so we don't really have room here to store everything for a long time. So just know those things are happening. If you would feel led to be involved, please, please do that. Uh, just to be helping the other people in the church. I want to give other, one other announcement. Um, Wednesday night prayer meeting from 8 to 10. We've set it up for two hours. Most uh, people may not be able to come for two hours. It's on Zoom. We send out the information every Tuesday if you want to join us. Uh, some people just come from the 8 to 8.30 or the 8 to 9. Maybe you need to put the children to bed and you can only come from the 9.30 to 10. Any of that is fine. Come and go as you please. The main thing is if churches are going to move forward in this world, we have to be a people that pray. And it's been interesting for me to watch all the people that are coming. And we, part of the time we break into small groups. Part of the time it's in large group. We do different things in prayer throughout the evening. Uh, but it's just a way to see each other. 
and talk to each other and pray together and reconnect. And so let me encourage you. Um, some of you, it's impossible. Don't worry about that. But those of you that it is possible, would you be willing to join us sometime between 8 and 10 on Wednesday night that God would continue to make us into a people that pray? All righty. Now, on to today's message. First question, is there anyone in your life that you would say is beyond the reach of God? Now, the spiritual way we're supposed to answer that question is, no, God can reach everyone. But, but, but practically speaking, is there anybody in your life that you're thinking that would be the last person that would ever put their faith in Jesus? Or any names? I'm, I'm encouraging you to think about it. Are there, are there any names or faces coming to mind? It could be a coworker, It could be a family member. Who is the last person that you know that you think would actually come to Jesus? Okay, how about, how about this question? Um, do you feel that you are beyond the reach of God because something you've done? Or how about this? Do you believe that you are beyond the blessing of God because of something you've done? Today, we're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 2. We're going to be continuing where we were last week. Those of you that were with us last week, if you will remember, uh, we were with the children of Israel as they crossed over the uh, Jordan River. It was at flood stage. It's over a million people. They're supposed to go across the river. God has given instructions, and it looks impossible. But yet God stops the river, and they pass over. And so now they're camping on the west side of the Jordan. And the next challenge, a few more kilometers to the west, is the city of Jericho. Human perspective, that's a problem. We're going to talk about that next week. But today, we're going to talk about what happens first. In Joshua 2, Joshua, now the leader of the Israelites, asked two spies to go into Jericho and bring back information. And so they go. It says they get to Jericho. They find a place to stay with a woman named Rahab, who happens to be a prostitute. Now, somehow it becomes known that there are two spies staying in Rahab's house. So the king of Jericho sends someone to talk to Rahab and say, Rahab, I need you to let those two men out of your house. I need you to bring them out because they are from the Israelites and they are spying out our city. And so Rahab says, I know exactly who you're talking about. And yes, two men did come to my house, but they just left right before the city gates closed for the night. If you hurry, you can catch them. And so they leave. Those who were there, whether it be soldiers or guards or whatever they were, they left. They believed what she said. They went out the city and began to search. And says, if we continue in Joshua 2, it says, Then, then uh, Rahab went up to her roof where she had hidden the two spies under the stalks of flax. It's a type of, of kind of a wheat related type of plant. Had laid them out on the roof. They were hidden under that. She goes up and begins to talk to them. And so the conversation goes like this. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord delivered you from the Red Sea and also how the Lord brought you victory over Sihon and Og, the two kings east of the Jordan River. Rahab is just telling, her the, telling them the history. 
Well, we've, we've heard about you. We've heard how you were rescued from Egypt. We heard how you destroyed the two mighty kings. And then she says, Everyone, everyone's heart is melted in fear. And it says, everyone's spirit has left them. And then she goes on and says this. If you get down to verse Part, verse, second part of verse 11. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now up till then, she was just telling us what was happening. Oh yeah, everybody is so afraid of you and we've heard and everyone is, their hearts have melted in fear and we know you're going to win. But then she goes on to state, for the Lord your God is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath beneath. What she just did, she just crossed the line. You could say a line of faith. Everyone else in Jericho, she's giving testimony that they are deathly afraid because they've heard the stories of the Israelites, but more importantly, the God of Israel. But now she is saying, but I know that he is the Lord God of the heaven above and earth below. Now, one of the reasons that's a big statement is back in their day, gods were geographical. Okay, that's the God of Egypt. That's the God of Babylon. This is the God of Canaan. But she was now saying, no, no, no. I understand that the Lord, your God, is the God over everything. It's also interesting when you look in in the English translation, the word Lord if, if you're aware of how we usually do that, if you see Lord with all capitals, it's the word Yahweh. She wasn't saying Lord. She was just saying, if you look at the verse, it goes back, for Yahweh, she's now claiming the specific name for Yahweh, your God, he is the God of heaven above and earth below. She's confessing her faith in the God of Israel. Now the story goes on. She asks, In the next verse, now then, please swear to me by the Lord. Once again, what is she saying? Now swear to me by Yahweh. Now this is coming out of whose mouth? Prostitute from a pagan city, from a godless culture. She says, Yahweh, God over all things. She fits into our mental category of, oh, she's the last person that would ever choose God. But she's now proclaiming her faith. And so the way the story goes, she says, basically swear before Yahweh that as I've been kind to you, you will be kind to me and my family. And so they talk and they make an agreement that if she will bring all of her family into her house, that when the Israelites destroy Jericho that they will protect her family. And it's a pretty strict rule. The spies are saying, if any of your family is outside in the street, outside of your house, there's no protection. The only way we can keep our word is if they're in the house, just like we said, and you don't tell anybody about what has happened between us today. And so then she goes to the window. She brings them along. Her her, house was built into the wall, it tells us, of the city. There's a window. She lets them out down outside the window, outside the wall, and instructs them to go hide in the mountains, hide in the hills three days. And when you're done, come back out. By then you'll be free and you can just go. And so that's what they do. But the other part of the agreement was this cord, this rope, it was red. It's called the scarlet cord. And it says, When you destroy, or when they say, when we destroy your city, make sure that's hanging out your window and we'll come for you. And it's interesting because they they promise, it says, um, it says they'll deliver them. And it talks about to the point of death. Like that's how committed they are. And so they leave. They take the word to Joshua three days later. And you know what's going to happen next. That's next week's sermon. And so we're, we're, we're stuck in this place with a, with a woman, Rahab, who doesn't seem like she is worthy of the grace of God. 
But then all of a sudden she believes. Is, is your God in your mind, in your understanding of Scripture, big enough to do that? Well, well we say easily amen because it's very distant. But how about that neighbor that's very loud and plays the music very loud and is very um, antagonistic? How about that uh, child that bullies your child? How about um, the sex trafficker or the murderer? Is our understanding of grace big enough when it actually becomes a little more personal, a little more close to home? I, I think there are several things we can learn from the story today. One is this. Grace is a gift of God. Now, we already talked about Rahab, but what else do you know about Rahab? Did you know that eventually she's going to become the great-great-grandmother of King David? That's a stretch, isn't it? Did you know that in Matthew 1, when you see this genealogy of the family of Jesus, guess whose name appears there? Rahab. Guess whose faith is it talked about in Hebrews in the book of James? Rahab, the prostitute pagan lady from a godless culture. Do we understand the size of the grace of God? And do we understand that it's not based on how good we are? If you died today and you stood before God and he asked, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? If your answer has anything to do with how good you think we are, then we're not understanding the Bible. Let me see if I can explain it this way. On the right side of the diagram is God, pure, holy, sinless. On the left, you have the bad people. And you have the good people. Now, by looking at this diagram, we'd say, wow, look at the bad people. Look at the gap. Isaiah 59 says, we are separated from God because of our sin. Look how far they are separated. Wow, God is going to have to give them a lot of grace to close that gap. But look at the good people. Yeah, they're separated by sin, but... It's not really that bad. They're just going to need a little bit of grace. Now, which one of these categories do you put yourself in? Don't answer out loud, please. Which one of these categories do you put yourself in? Because really, this diagram is not biblical. It does not line up with what Scripture says. But if we're not careful, this is the way we think. Oh, no, but I've been in the church a while. And, and I, I know some, some Bible verses. Uh, my parents were Christian. I, I gave money to some people that were in need. Really, I'm good. It's almost like God is lucky to have me on his team. I am such a blessing. And really, I only needed this much grace. The problem with thinking, well, there's several problems. One of thinking like that is, first of all, it's not what the Bible says. The second thing of, in our mind, if we think like this, how amazing is God's grace? Not very amazing, because I only needed this much. But it says you and I begin to grasp what the Bible says about our sin and how fallen that we are. That amaze, a grace begins to be amazing to us because we realize we are so undeserving. This is just a diagram I'm going to show you. The next one, it can never totally communicate, but let's, let's see what this is what we're trying to say. God on the right, holy, bad. Okay, it's nowhere close to God. Ready for the next part? Worse. And that's still an understatement. And really, you don't even have to separate those because they're so similar. The gap is so big that none of us are worthy of the grace of God. 
None of us. In the midst of our even silent sins, our greed, our lust, our pride, our covetousness. It doesn't matter if somebody is the murderer or someone happens to be the person with very good etiquette, who's very polite, who's well-educated, who seems to be nice. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None are good. No one seeks God. We all are wicked. Scripture calls us enemies of God. We are blind. We are walking in darkness. We are strangers. We are foreigners. Scripture uses all these words to describe anyone who is without Christ. But Jesus is different. Jesus is the only one. The reason I show Jesus on the diagram is our tendency, if you're anything like me and I'm anything like you, is when we think about sin, we compare ourselves to someone worse. And we, somehow we build up our spiritual ego to think we're okay. My friends, without Christ, we're not okay. We're never going to be okay. Even with Christ, when we drift from him, we're not okay. We fall into worry. We begin to think thoughts about ourselves, th thoughts about other people. We slip quickly out of the truth. We have to stay with Christ. Christ is our comparison. And as we compare ourselves to Christ, that leaves us in a really bad spot. Because next to his perfect, white, brilliant holiness, we are a fallen, sinful people. That's the only comparison we're here to make. But because he is holy and sinless, only he could die on the cross to pay for our sins, to pay for the price, for the penalty that we owed. Jesus is our answer. And it's not just Jesus for salvation, it's Jesus every day. The gospel is what carries us through this life. Now as we continue on this thinking, we find this in Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, once Rahab turned from her sin and put her faith in Yahweh, the past no longer mattered. Listen to that again. The past no longer mattered mattered do you live in that truth or do you listen to the voice of the evil one who continues to remind you of the past now there's a point that the past serves us well because then we remember what we've been saved from and we give glory to God as long as we walk in who we are in Christ we can still think of the past and it be a benefit for us. But in those moments where we begin to forget about the gospel and the newness in Christ and we begin to be dominated by the evil one and the thoughts of what we've done, it begins to take us to a dark place that we are not supposed to walk in. Just like in Rahab's life, when you look, how can she be the great-great-grandmother of King David? How is that possible? How can she be in the lineage of Christ? Because once we come into the faith, the past no longer is counted against us. We serve a God who when he now looks at us, if we are in Christ, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Please don't ask me to explain that because that's beyond logic. But when we put our faith in Jesus, that's what God sees. The righteousness of Christ. We have now moved beyond the past. Now something else that we're going to see here in this story is faith is confirmed by good works. Now stay with me on this one. We have to walk carefully here. Faith, salvation is not earned by good works. There's nothing we can do to earn it. It is a free gift. But if a faith is sincere, it should result in good works. Now we're going to see this very clearly in the life 
of Rahab. In James 2, we find this scripture. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? I will show you my faith by my works. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? It's the idea, if if we have been truly saved, if we're not just uh, playing religion, if we're not just going through uh, the rituals, if we have been truly saved, if our faith is truly in Christ, even though we are not perfect, there should be good works that come out of our lives. If there are no good works, if our heart is not drawn to God, if we are not gradually growing in Christ-likeness, If our heart is not convicted when we sin, the question is, is it really faith at all? Um, One pastor from the past, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he would say it like this. Faith shows itself in the whole personality. We see it in the story of Rahab. She heard what Yahweh had done. She put her fear in God. And then she risked everything to help God's people. As Martin Lloyd Jones would say, it, it, it was whole personality. Now, I, honestly, let's just stop for a minute right here. When you think about your life, and I think about my life, does your faith affect the way you think? Does your faith affect the way that you feel? Does it affect your emotions? Does faith affect the way that we act? Because it should. If we have truly been changed from the inside out, if we've been given a new nature, if we are now no longer slaves to sin, Are we for the first time ever now spiritually alive? It should dramatically change us. And I know it's a process. I know we're here now, and hopefully the longer we walk with Christ, the more righteous, or that's probably not the best word, the the more obedient we walk in Christ. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's room for growth. But at the same time, if we have put our faith in Jesus, there should be change. And so for us to say, oh, yes, I'm a Christian, but I have no conviction when I sin. I am greedy as I've always been. I lust and have no problem with it. I am proud and arrogant and all these things. If those are characteristics of our life and there's nothing in our heart that at least is drawing us back home, we need to do some major evaluation. Because scripture says, whether it be about Rahab or the other scriptures, if the faith is real, it impacts a person. Faith changes everything. And so let me encourage you. I don't don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe you've accepted, adopted this way of thinking where everything's compartmentalized. On Sunday, I'm spiritual. On Monday, I work hard. On Friday, I party. Whatever it may be, the Christian faith, there's no compartment. Christ comes to be Lord over everything. And so if we're going to walk in the faith, then will we submit to that? And just say, it could be you're here today and you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, that's a new idea. I I didn't know faith had the power to change, affect my emotions. I didn't know faith had the power to lead me into good works. I didn't know faith had the power to even conform and transform the way I think. If it's new news to you today, pray into it. Beg into it. Read the Bible into it that God would begin to show us the full extent of our faith. As we continue on in these verses, um, we get all the way down to Hebrews 11. I don't know if you're familiar with Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is like this chapter of giants of the faith. 
And it lists Abraham. Let me, let me see if I can look, find it real quick. Abraham, by faith, Abraham offered up his son in Isaac. His son Isaac. By faith, Noah, out of reverent fear, constructed an ark. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. What do you see in every situation here? By faith, and there's an action. Every time. If you read through Hebrews 11, where it's talking about all the giants of the faith, it'll say by faith, and then there's the active result. By faith, the ark was built. By faith, the son was offered up. By faith, and guess who's actually included in this list? Of the giants of the faith. Here she is. By faith, Rahab the prostitute. Once again, how in the world is she in the, in the list with Abraham and Moses and Noah? By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. What is the author of Hebrews trying to do for us? He's just trying to let us know everyone is included. I don't know how big and broad and vast the grace of your God is, but the God of the scripture is big enough and gracious enough to invite me and you in. He knows what we do when no one's watching. He knows what we did before we ever knew Christ. And yet like Rahab, he invites us in. And he's not just inviting us in to tolerate us. He's not just inviting us in and having to put up with us. He invites us in. Old Testament talks about how he sings over us. That's a stretch, isn't it? That the God of the universe, the holy, perfect, loving God, would find joy in you and me. But can you and I let that sink in? He knows. But yet he loves We finally get to the last point, the providence of God. When you look at this story, when I look at this story, at any point, the story of the spies in Jericho could have gone wrong. It could have been they arrived in Jericho and couldn't find a place to stay and no place to hide and they were arrested immediately and it got worse from there. It could be that they arrived at Rahab's house. She invited them in, and then she sent a message to the king. They're right over here. Come get them. And she turned them in. Um, it could have been that the, the guards, the police arrived. They didn't believe Rahab. They pushed her out of the way, went in, searched the house, and they found the spies. It could have been that uh, Rahab's advice wasn't good. And they were captured quickly. I mean, the story could have gone wrong a hundred different ways. But it didn't. Why? Because in the providence of God, it went the way he wanted. It was his will. He's the one who promised the land. He's the one who made the way. And so in the providence of God, he is the one that allowed things to happen exactly like they do. Now, for you and for me, is our God in sovereign control of the world? Once again, our church answer says, yes. What does our emotional answer say? What's your emotional answer say when the boss says, today's your last day? What do your emotional answers say when your kids are definitely not obeying anymore? What does your emotional answer say when somebody, maybe even you, gets really sick. Because honestly, remember, our faith is supposed to be such that it affects our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. Any of the things could have happened, but in the providence of God, they did not. Our confidence is that when we follow God, we can be confident in the outcome. Now, be careful here. Listen, not that it'll always go the way we want. 
or expect, but that a sovereign God is in charge and he never leaves us. No matter how our story plays out, no matter how your story or my story plays out, we will never be left alone. We will never meet a challenge that the grace is not sufficient. We will never reach a point of darkness that his light is not enough. We will never be so far out into a spiritual wilderness that God can still not reach out there and bring us home. He is sovereign. He is over all things. And no matter what he allows or guides to happen in our life, he will always be with us. That is our confidence. What does tomorrow bring? I don't have any idea what tomorrow brings. I don't know. But we know this. He works all things for the good. He does not sleep and he does not slumber. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So what do we do? We stand and we walk and we obey and we trust and we give him our full devotion because there's no other worthy place to put it. Now we're going to do something different as we finish today. There are going to be some phrases that come up on the screen. Lee is going to be playing the piano. I want you to stay where you're seated. I'm going to sit down. And we're just going to have phrases that come up on the screen. And as the screen, as they come up on the screen, it's just thought from the sermons today. I just want you to sit and think about it, meditate on it, maybe pray about it. And then I'll give you the next phrase. And then I'll give you the next phrase. I know many times in our services, there's no time to process. So I want this to be a time to process. And after that, we'll sing and we'll close. Um, but if you just bow your heart with us now and just follow the phrases that come up on the screen. Please.
Father, we come before you today. Lord, we just pray that your story in the midst of Rahab's life would somehow speak to us as you would see fit. Father, forgive us today when we are self-righteous and believe that we deserved salvation. Father, forgive us when our faith does not result in good works. Lord, take us back to the cross. Take us back to the love and the price that was paid that your love would stir in us a love for others. Father, we praise you that you are a sovereign God, that there's no day you will not be in charge. There's, there's no part of our lives that you are not worthy to be Lord over. Father, we just pray that you'd rescue us from ourselves today, from our self-righteousness, from our worry, from our seeking to carry the weight of the world on our own shoulders, for our pride, Lord, we just pray that you'd bring us back to the core things of the gospel. Being aware of our sin, being aware of your grace. And that, Father, we would love because you first loved us. Father, use us in spite of who we were and in the midst of being who we are. Father, for your glory. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we respond to the message.
in the presence of my Heavenly Father, we're so grateful because we're yours. We're so grateful because you have our names engraved in your hands. Father, we are so grateful because you're singing praises over us. And you loved us so dearly that you send your son to die on the cross on our behalf. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve such grace. But we thank you for it. And we thank you because you've called us also to be instruments of your grace. Help us as we depart to, to show this grace, to show this love, to show by the way we live the faith that we have in you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Have a great Sunday and see you next week.